This boy, he loved the music. There was an unsatiable pleasure and desire to play music. He loved sometimes to sing praises to the name of Jehovah. Because he derived the strength. He derived the pleasure. Every time he pronounced the name Jehovah, he got power directly from heaven. And so he never refrained from singing praises to the name of the one who created the heaven and the earth. And this man had a strength. His voice was so amazing. He could sing when people could cry. He could sing when people whose heart were broken down, they could mend it because he was anointed directly by the hand of God. There was a time this man, in fact, he was a boy. He was a ruddy, wonderful, beautiful boy. Church, you need to get scared when a man is beautiful in the church. You got to take caution and precaution when you find a man who is beautiful. Many men in church, many men in Israel were handsome, but it was rare for someone to spot a man who was beautiful. The Bible, when it says that this man was beautiful, we got to take caution and precaution as we read what the Lord is trying to tell us. This man was beautiful. He could sing when his sheep could stand and listen to his voice and they would also bleat with him in chorus, singing praises to the one who created them. This boy was an amazing man. Come a time. Somebody came to him and he said, Now we have a, an appointment. What? Yes, we have an appointment order. From who? From the king. To do what? To sing. Wow. Is there anything else that I could take pleasure in? But to sing to the glory of the one who created even the king. So he said, let me come. And the appointment order was in his hand. He went in the presence of the king and he started singing. The man was mesmerized. The man could forget all the worries. The man could forget all the battles and the wars that he is supposed to have. And he was completely immersed in every word and the song of this boy was singing. He didn't stop there. The boy was amazing in playing music. He could not only sing, but he could also play musical instruments. So the Bible says at one point of time, this same boy who was beautiful, this same man who was handsome, this great man even invented 3,000 music instruments. Invention, innovation was a part of his genes. It was in his moral fiber. It was in his genes. And God wrote all that in his genes. The man was amazing. When he walked, he was valiant and gallant and even men could even envy this boy. Come a time. He said the assignment is over. The boy went back to his home. When he went back to his home, that was the time he was given vision by God himself to do what he needs to do. In fact, he, that is a time when he aligned his heart according to the word of God. That is a time he spent his solitary time alone with God, singing praises to his name and meditating upon his scriptures and singing more songs. And he was praising God in his heart. And that is the reason why God immediately said and said, Now this boy, son, God, I got to take care of this boy. There was a time... The father calls this boy. Boy, come. Yes, dad. My son. I think you got to go back to your brother. Go and watch what's going to happen there. I'll give you some food. He loaded an ass with the full of bread and ten cheeses. And he said, go take these things and provisions for your brothers who are in the battlefield. And the boy was so happy because he is going back to see the king. He is going to see the, his own brothers. And so with all his happiness, he saddled the cart and he started going to that place called Shukot. 
when he came there, everyone was kind of having a question mark in their mind. You know, sometimes when you visit somebody, and when somebody's home is not in order, and you appear that without even announcing that you're going there, you will find each of them looking at one another. Who is this one? Who invited him? We are already in trouble. Who is this guy who has just come inside our home to do what? We already don't have food. Why has he come here to eat food, which is not there? So you will begin to look at one another. Now, when this boy came to that valley and he saw that people had questions in front of their eyes and there was a lot of doubt and there was a lot of scary things that are happening. And so he looked at each one of them. He said, now, guys, what's happening? I said, don't you know what's happening? I don't know. But what I know, you guys are so scared. He said, well, we have a problem. You mean you have a problem in the land of Israel? You mean there is a problem in the church of God? You mean there is a problem where people worship the Lord in truth and in spirit? Yes. Oh, yes. So they said, the problem is something like we can't explain very well. The boy said, you mean you have a problem that you can't explain? Yes, this problem is something that we cannot explain. It is inexplainable, okay? So what next? So this boy, in his innocence, he was just walking up and down. And that's when he saw a fella. Huge. Huge. Nine feet and nine inches. Is there anyone here in Mount Nine feet, nine inches. And the man was screaming in his bass voice. He said, can you hide yourself himself, a man? <sighs> King Saul at one point of time, he said, seek. Me, a man in the land of Israel, who could come and soothe my soul, seeking a man. And then later, King Saul said, provide me a man who could come and tell me how I need to praise God. And it is the same word. This, it, this Philistine comes and he shouts in his best voice. And as he shouted and as he was screaming, his voice was thundering. And his voice was echoing the entire valley of Shukot. And it was ringing through the ears of King Saul who was seated there. It was ringing through the ears of the soldiers who were around there. And every time the man spoke, it sent chills in the spine of those guys. And they claimed themselves the children of Israel. What is troubling you, church, today? What is it that you are scared of? What is it that you are afraid of? What is threatening you, church? And this man, sometimes the problems, the uncircumcised, those who do not know the true God, he, they can come and tell you, provide yourself a man. Now I want to understand the church, the, the children of Israel, I'm equating them to the church of God. It's as if this uncircumcised Philistine is telling, provide yourself a wolf, a man. Seek yourself a man. I'm also telling you in the presence of God, do you as a church have a man? There are men around, do you have a man who can fight? And as his voice was thrilling and Shattering through the spine of the king and his subject and all the soldiers. This boy comes. In all his innocence, innocence, he comes and he tells the king, I'm going to fight this guy. He walked in a swag. And he said, oh king, do you know what? I can fight this guy. The king looked at him and said, really? <laughs> really? You want to go and fight this guy? How? Boy said, let it be known unto you, O king, when I was in the wilderness, 
taking care of my flock. There came a lion and took one sheep from my flock. And I did not wait and see what was happening. Within a fraction of a second, I swung to action. And I, you know what I did? I held this lion by its beard. The lion that this, the king looked at. Okay. You mean you held lion by its beard? <gasps> Go ahead. And I did not even wait. When I held the lion by its beard, I slew it and I took the lamb that was in its mouth and I rescued my lamb. Oh, Mary had a little lamb. Oh, Mary had a, a little lamb. And the little lamb went wherever Mary went. Do you remember that rhyme that you learned in the primary school? Mary had a little lamb, little lamb. And what Mary is that? That was the Mary whom we read in the book of Matthew. Oh, that Mary had indeed a what? A little lamb. And David said, when I saw my lamb in the, in the mouth of the light, I couldn't wait. As if it is not enough. Soon after this episode was over, uh -huh, there came another bear. What? Bear. So I looked around and he asked his ministers, have you seen a bear in your life? No. This boy has seen a bear. Hey, what happened? He said, when the bear came, I tore its mouth and I killed it and I fought it and the Lord delivered the bear in my hands. Do you, do you need another episode? So I said, no, no. Already it is too much for my head to understand what you're trying to tell me. Go ahead, go ahead. We are here to watch what is going to happen. After all, there is one human being who is going to be killed today. Please go ahead. This little boy was beautiful. He came in front of that giant. And he said, uh-huh. The giant said, I asked you guys for a man. And you are sending me a suckling child. <laughs> this guy? You mean this boy? Who has not even started growing his mustache. Whose voice is swinging between alto and tenor. It is not even graduated into base. You mean you have no one else in the land of Israel. And you could send a boy. But he did not know that this boy came from Bethlehem Ephrata. That was summoned exactly in the book of Micah. Which says... Oh, Bethlehem, Ephrata, you are one among the thousands in Judah. But out of you came the son of David, who was the Messiah, who will come and redeem those who are lost. David looked at him and he said, I'm going to kill you. Excuse me. Repeat that. In the land of Israel, we tell only once. When we tell once, it is as if I have told you 100 times. Take it from me. You circumcised for liar. Wait. And then this little boy, he went down the brook and he, he swung to action. And before that, they tried to put on the armor on him. And he said, this is too much for him. And my Bible says, he says that I have not proved it. Which means I've never used it. I'm not used to this kind of a setup. Please remove these things away. And Saul said, but what are you going to do? I have something in my hand. I have a sling. A what? A sling. Okay. So he shook off. The armor. Let me tell you, children of God. David went in the armor of God. When you go with the armor of God, no Goliath can stand on your way. Somebody say amen.
and said, and he went down the brook and he took a pebble down. He went aside, he took another one and he's found that, ah, uh -uh, this is not the right size for me. He took another one. He counted five and Goliath in all his patience he was watching. The guy was huge and gigantic. His armor bearer was just in front of him. And the man was fuming. In fact, the children of Israel were able to see steam coming through his ears because he was furious. He was angry. He was irritated. He was full of fury. If given a chance, he would come and tear this boy into pieces. But he said, I will wait. And as his eyes became red, this boy was in his school. He was cool. He was cool and he said, let me pick the best. He took the stones and as Goliath was watching, he said, am I a dog? Did you pick stones to throw at me? But he did not know what he was doing. This man called David, he did not know and understand what he was up to. And he was still more furious. David put, the pebbles in his sling bag. And he took one. Put it in the sling. And he told him. Goliath. You have come with your arm. You have come with a spear. You have come with whatever. But I am telling you. I have come in the name of my God Jehovah. Somebody say amen. When you go in the name of God, nothing will stop you. Nothing will hinder you. Nothing will stop your way and from achieving what you're supposed to achieve. You and I, we may have Goliaths in our lives today. Goliaths could be the lost job. Goliaths could be the lost business. Goliaths could be the lost property. Goliath could be your last husband. Goliath could be the one who left your home and he is living with someone else. Goliath could be that woman who left you alone with your children and he, she is living with somebody. Goliath could be someone who is always irritating you at your workplace. Goliath could be your boss who is actually trying to sexually abuse you. Goliath could be anybody who is stepping on your head and stopping your promotion. Somebody is there who is now fuming and you want that Goliath to go away. Let me tell you in the presence of God, unless you go in the name of God, the Goliath will remain on your way. The moment David pronounced that statement, Goliath, I've come in the name of my God. Immediately heaven's doors opened up. The windows of heavens opened up. And God in his throne, in his mighty throne, he looked eagerly and he said, what is happening down there in the valley of Shukoth? And he looked around and the host of angels were ready, expecting one command from God. And he just looked at them and he looked around and he said, hold on. The heavens were waiting for one command from God such that they could come and deliver this boy. God said, no, hold on. Hold on. This boy, he put the stone, the pebble into his sling and he started rotating all round and round and round and round. And at us exactly at the same time, God looked at the angels and he said, Oh, the host of angels, the unseen angels came in their battalions. Oh, my God has thousands and ten thousands and thousands and thousands of angels. Even if he sends one Gabriel, he can annihilate the entire globe. Even if he sends one angel, he can break all the chains that are in front of you. He can block everything that is unblocked. He can unblock everything that is blocked across your way. Child of God. When God summoned those angels, the unseen host of angels come, came in battalions. The host of heaven came and asked David, they knew that this boy was a small boy. They knew this boy did not have the strength. They knew that he did not have the might. They did not know. They knew that his momentum was not enough. And the moment he started swinging around and around and around, 
the angels also now started pushing the, the sling around to gain more momentum. The angel said, careful, it has to go at 3,000 RPM. It has to now go into 6,000 RPM. They started in their strength. They said round, A and round, and I round. The angels were able to see. And once they had the momentum, angel, one angel said to, a, to the David, and he, to, and he told David, it is time to release. Even David released a pebble from that sling. The stone went. That was the rock of ages. That was the rock of salvation. They did not know. Even the children of Israel, even the king of Israel did not know the rock and the pebble that David used is the rock of salvation. The ancient of days on whose rock and whose uh, the salvation is come to all of us. And the angels now. It is time for them to now increase the speed of the pebble. They said, now, all the angels line up. Now you'll have to blow. When you blow, this pebble will even gain more momentum. And David did not know in all his innocence because he came in the name of the Lord. He came in the banner of Jehovah. And so when the moment the stone went out of the sling, the stone went at the speed of light. Oh, because it was geared by the host of angels. It was hosted and it was triggered by the power of the heavens. When the stone went out, the angels started blowing. They all arrayed from where David was standing until where Goliath was standing. And they all started blowing. The stone gained momentum and speed and it gained the speed of a light until the Bible says the stone stuck forehead because in his fury this guy, an idiot he removed his helmet because he was so angry that he could remove his helmet and threw away and he said, what? It was also an act of an angel. Many times your enemies can go God will know how to strip them naked. God has promised and that is the reason why David elsewhere he says Thou shalt prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. God can never prepare a table if you don't have enemies. You must have enemies. You should have enemies. That is when God will prepare a table in the presence of your enemies. And you will be on the head of the table. Dictating terms with your enemies. Telling them what you sh they should do. Because God's power is with you. Bible says, the stone that David released, oh, that rock of salvation, it went straight to the point where all the nerve endings would begin or end, I don't know. The Bible says, the stone went straight on the forehead. The Bible says, it sunk. Hello? It did not bounce. It sunk into the skull of Goliath. It shattered him. It shattered him. It made him to realize his consciousness. He didn't know what was happening. And the Bible says, he fell face towards the earth. David did not even wait for a second. He went, jumped on the bosom of this giant, took his own spear, that is a spear of, the Dev, of Goliath, he cut off the head of Goliath, took him and the head by his hair, and he majestically started walking. Hey, children of God, somebody say amen. When you go with the power of God, there is nothing that you cannot do. Child of God. Sabbath. Sabbath, but he say, Amen. Ah, don't disappoint me. Don't disappoint God. I thought the Mount Olives is a spirit filled church. You come to Musa and learn how to say, Amen. Somebody say, Amen. Oh, no, I have seen some Musa associates. Somebody they say, Amen. God is good. And all the time, Oh, yes. 
child of God, it is such an amazing and thrilling experience to read every record from the scriptures. I know that the Lord is good. Indeed, he is good. Sister Irene, come forward. I don't know at what time you guys are supposed to finish the sermon. But tell your church that was just an introduction. Elder says it was just an introduction. <laughs> it was just an introduction. God bless you. You've got the announcement. Amen. Amen. <laughs> if you have already got an appointment at this time, I am sorry. May God bless you. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to stand in the holy presence of God and to share his precious word with you. I cannot start speaking without uplifting the name of the Lord. And to raise your spirit and tell you how God is powerful. You do not know the God whom you are worshipping. Many times you come here empty hearted and you begin to lament and tell God and complain to him as if he is a collector of complaints. No sir. God is a God who can command one word and his host of angels could come and rescue you from whatever situation you are in. Have that hope as you are seated in the next few minutes. Have that hope and faith that God is able to transform your life as you have come. God is able to change the course of your life because God is a God who will change 360 degrees, not 120, not 90 degrees. God has the power, God has the authority to change the course of your life 360 degrees. Somebody say amen. amen. But David was just a shepherd. He was handling the cattle of his father. It was not even owned by his own self. The man was made a king. Somebody here, you may think that you have, all that you have is a herd of fuck or a cattle. Goats that could bleat. Cows that could maw. Cats that you can mew in the house. Let me tell you, God can make something out of you, even if you're nothing. Have the trust. As you are seated in the presence of God, meditate upon this one. Let's pray. Father, another chance you have given me to stand in your presence. Do not allow me to speak anything else other than what you wanted to talk to your children. Season every word that is conceived in my mind. Condition every word that comes out of my mouth. And so I plead with you, may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be accepted in your sight as we plead in your holy presence, as we approach your throne of majesty. Teach us your ways. Fountain of wisdom, O oh, fountain of knowledge, Alpha and Omega, O oh, the beginning and the end, come and motivate us. Transform our thinking. Transform the way in which we begin to understand certain things. Give us unique and different perspectives that would glorify your holy name. Abide with us, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Turn with me to the book of Daniel chapter 1 and verse 17. Thank you, my sister, who read the verse. Which book? Did you remember what Sister Rainin told you? Do you remember? Or should I ask her to come back? Book of? Chapter and verse. And my Bible says this. It is a powerful verse. Begin to read with a different perspective now. And the Bible says, as for these four, who what? For who? Children. You got to know and understand. When you read the term children in the scripture, 
they should be in the age bracket of 12 to 17. Minor, not major. Four children. What does your scripture say after that? Are you reading? Okay. Oh, you are reading from there. You don't have Bibles. Do you have Bibles? Yes. How many of you? I hope you came to church or you just want to visit along the way. <laughs> anyway, that's for another time. As for these four children, the Bible says God gave them what? Knowledge. And what? Knowledge. And what? Knowledge. In all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Today is education Sabbath. Many times when you come across the term education Sabbath, you understand these are for the kids. These are for the secondary school students. These are for the university students. No. Education is for all of us. Let me break this down. Allow me to refrain from my preaching style and go to a lecturing style. I love to read philosophy. And one specific philosopher always catches my attention, Plato and Descartes. Those two actually. Plato was a student of Socrates. Socrates' understanding of these terms is thinking of an ignorant makes him wise. Sometimes it's hard to understand those guys' state. What is the state? Thinking of the ignorant is what? Plato says, all that you see is not real. But all that you think is real. Ah. Realism. The philosophy of realism. All that you see, meaning, when I see you, you are not real. But when I think that you are there, that is real. That is who? Philosophy. The Bible talks about certain things. And I want to take this opportunity to read a lot of verses. If you may please. Go with me to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is a book that is after Psalms. Are you there? Are you there? Book of? Chapter? I didn't tell you. Tell that I didn't tell you. Hey, this is the class now. I'm a lecturer. I'm your professor. The introduction is over. Holy day. Hey, call it. Now, Proverbs chapter what? 1, verse 7. The Bible says, it's a very famous verse. We always quote it liberally, but not knowing what it means. And the Bible says, the fear... Of the Lord is the what? Beginning, Beginning of? Uh -uh. Read from your Bible. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of? Knowledge. Yeah. Someone already finished saying it is the beginning of? That is the level of our Bible reading. No problem. We are here in the church to read more Bible. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Let's read another verse. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13. That's the basic definition. Many times we understand what does it mean to fear God. Now that gives a clear definition. What does your Bible say? The fear of the Lord is to what? To hate evil. Now... Replace that in the other verse, Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7. 
Did you understand? Should I repeat? What does Proverbs 1, 7 say? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now here, in chapter 8 and verse 13, what do we read? The fear of the Lord is to do what? To hate evil. Replace that one. Uh huh. Anyone? Now this score is always misleads the judge. Someone. Hey, student. Hey, to Dian. I told you I'm a professor. Come. Young one. This mic is better than this. Read it. Fear evil is the beginning of knowledge. Fear? Evil. Because the seven says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The other one says, yeah. Proverbs 8 verse 13 Someone says, help her holding a Bible. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord is what? To hate. To hate evil. <laughs> Replace that there. I replace which one with which? Head. Okay. The fear of the Lord. Another one, another one, another one. We don't have time. You're going to stand here. Come, come, come. Anyone want to try? Hey, young. You're going to sing a song by the time finish the song. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that would be to hate evil is the beginning of knowledge. Amen. Slightly corrected. <laughs> Hating evil is the beginning of knowledge. knowledge. To hate evil is also the beginning of knowledge. knowledge. Beautiful. I will sing a song for you. Later. <laughs> Thank you. How many of you have understood? I will go one by one. This is unit one. You are going to have seven units today, whether you like it or not. Have you heard? So if you are hungry, free, feel free to go eat and come back. Still, we will find us in unit four. <laughs> the Bible is extremely serious. When you read any verse from the Bible... It is a spoken word of God. When God speaks a word, it doesn't come out and return void. It has to go and do something in someone's mind or life or whatever. It can never come back in void. So the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Amen. And to fear God is to do what? Hate evil. So in other words, the moment you begin to hate what? What are you gaining? Thank you. You are very good students. I've given you 10 marks for unit one. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You, you see, you're not interested in marks. Should I reduce it? <laughs> Let's read another words. Let's read uh, mm, Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 6. Mm -hmm. Are you there? Yes. Now the Bible is saying, For the Lord giveth wisdom. Who gives wisdom? The Lord. the Lord gives wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh what? Knowledge. Knowledge. And? Now how many words are there? I mean, um, related words are there. Three. What are those? Wisdom. wisdom Knowledge. Knowledge understanding. Let me tell you, break this down to the basics. This is common for anyone. Whether you are six years old or six months old, or whether you are six years old or six, six or years old, or even triple six, it doesn't matter. <laughs> there are three. There are three words that are important there. What are those? Wisdom, knowledge, understanding. I'll come to that. Yeah, now you need what? Two. 
Let's read another verse. The book of Psalms chapter 111 verse 10. Slightly go, don't go too far. Slightly flip off two pages. You will be there. Psalms what? 111. And verse 10. What does it say? A, it's a new thing. The fear of the Lord is a what? Beginning of? What does Proverbs 1 7 say? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, here, what does it say? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6, what did we read? Who gives wisdom? It is the Lord who gives you what? And out of his mouth comes what? Knowledge and understanding. So, the book of Psalms says, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Replace the fear of God. What are we supposed to replace it? Hating evil. To hate evil is the beginning of what? To hate evil is the beginning of what? Knowledge. Are we there? Is unit two okay? So far? We are on paragraph eight. <laughs> Let's go. All right. Let's read another beautiful verse. Let's read uh, Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10. What does it say? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One. Haven't you seen all the three there? Yes or no? Yes. So in other words, fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Replace the fear. To hate evil is the beginning of knowledge. To hate evil is the beginning of wisdom. To hate evil is the beginning of Someone come forward and summarize that. Heard much about Mount Olives. I hope you are going to uphold your mm. Mm. professor is calling. Come out. Come fast. Come fast. Somebody. Elders, are you there? Look at your flock. <laughs> These guys are not want to respond. You is, are you alive? Hello? Yes. It does Mount Olives have youth. Unless you're completely confused today. Come, someone come. Before you forget. Are you youth? Don't cover up your youth. These guys, they speak a lot in the church, but why can't they speak now? Come. It's quite a shaming. Even Muslim members. Anand. Okay. You qualify to be a youth. Mm. In order for you to show that you fear God or to know you fear God, you have to hate evil. Go slow. <laughs> Even me, I didn't understand. Okay. To hate evil is the beginning of knowledge. Have you heard? To hate evil. What do you mean by evil? Evil is anything that you do that does not praise the name of God. For example, stealing, killing, abusing. These ones we don't do, we are Adventists. <laughs> Tell us something that we do. Eating, eating wrongly, yet we know the health principles. Wrongly. Overeating, for example. Left hand. No, overeating. Specify. Okay, according... You know, in questions, when I ask you a question, specify. All right. You can't see refer to Ten Commandments. I will give you zero. <laughs> All right. Specify. The book of uh, Galatians tells us 
in chapter 5, if you read verse 22 and verse 23, Beautiful. verse 23 tells us that uh, temperance, and after the word temperance, he says, again, such there is no law. And the Bible tells us to be temperate mm -hmm. in all things, mm -hmm. not some things. Mm -hmm. So if you're not temperate in all things, then you are disobeying God. You're defending Adventists too much. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us something that we do. That Thank you. Lying. Don't we lie? We do. Gossip. Hey, Lugambo. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> <laughs> Afternoon program on a Sabbath day is full of what? Lugambo. Lugambo. <laughs> we, we gather together in groups. Idleness. Very good. Where we, sp You're doing well. Aha. we spend a lot of time uh, talking about things that are needless, yet I we have souls who are perishing next to us. Thank you. Yes, that is evil. Yes, is negligence. sin, my brother. Yes. God hates negligence. You can't see your fellow brother. Hey, okay. <laughs> You are a good steward. <laughs> you are appointed today. Amen. Have you heard? What else? Uh, neglect of duty. Very good. We, we neglect duty. Adventists are known for negligence of duty. Many times employers employ Adventists. And on a Sabbath day, you sing songs. Eh? Joyful, joyful, we adore. Then the elder says, hey, this guy sings well. <laughs> Maybe I, he will make a good employee in my business. You take him. Come Monday, he'll say, elder, you know, next week is the week of prayer. Today, I'll have to start preparation. And you vanish away. Who are you? Adventist. Have you heard? What else? What else? Display. Huh? Love of display. Let me explain. Since you display, say they have to I be direct. Anything. Uh, most of the times, we, we, I receive complaints from my friends about Adventist. We have become people who want to show. We are. Hey. Eh? Showing off. Adventists are known for that, by the way. We show off too much, even when you don't have anything to eat at home. <laughs> you have gone to your ATM, and the ATM is giving gas. <laughs> and you come straight to the church, and I said, like, you know, <laughs> I just came from Johannesburg. But you came actually from ATM. <laughs> You're right. We are people who show off too much. Eh, too much, oh. Mm. What else? Pretense. Hey. Pretense. Hey. We are so good at pretense. Yes, yes. We pretend that we are faithful, we keep the Sabbath, but at the end of the day, the record, which is against each of our names, is contrary to what nah, we claim. Yeah. Have you heard? It is your member speaking. <laughs> Me, I am a visitor. <laughs> I will come, I will speak and go. <laughs> Announcement was given by Iron. Now it is the youth speaking. Have you heard? Another? Speak. Another one is, uh, we do not realize the use of time. Thank you. We are supposed to be people who must pray, Lord, help us number our days. Redeeming time is the need of an Adventist today. But we have all the time to waste it watching Nigerian movies. Soap operas. The ones coming from Brazil. Thank you, my brother. My spirit has come back. We can go. <laughs> Soap operas from the land of Brazil. The Spanish, whatever. And you want to exactly behave like the soap operas with your husband. So far, you have been calling him by name. Now you're beginning to call him honey. 
from where? Hello, from where? Yeah? From Brazil. Speaking habits. Adventists, today we are suffering from a disease called behavioral acquisition. You are striving to establish your identity. And you want to identify yourself with the world. When you put an Adventist and a worldly person, there is no difference today. To an extent, Adventists could even paint their lips indigo. Do you know indigo? Hello? Purple? Purple? Some of their lips are even like rainbow. Black? Red, purple, burgundy, green, it goes inside. A rainbow smile. <laughs> Adventist. And you're a faithful tithe returner. You're, you're number one when you pay tithe. Please, the deacons come and you are there. During the week, who were you? Rainbow. Evil. Today the church is required to hate evil. All these are evil things. The book of Job says, and God gave a certificate to this man called Job. And he says, do you know that there is a guy who eschewed evil? Please run away. I don't know at what time you normally close your divine service, but in Musta we don't have. Let us go to Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 13. Pray that we finish early. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse. What does it say? In the lips of him that hath understanding wisdom is found. But a rod is for the back of him that is void of understanding. Because of time, let me break this down once again. In the world of education, there is something called the education pyramid. What is that? Now, this is unit three. Unit what? How many units are there? We are in unit what? You better answer, otherwise I'll go back to unit one to revise. Have you heard? The education pyramid. This is common for anybody. Anyone who is into business. Anyone who is employed. Anyone who is in the secondary school. Anyone who is in the university education. Anybody, anybody, anybody who is in the path of success. They are exposed to this education pyramid. The most basic is knowledge. What is that? That is the most fundamental. That's the foundation. That's the basic foundation. Knowledge. What is knowledge? To know is knowledge. To know is knowledge. To be aware is knowledge. Are we together? So when you are a student of BCom, say commerce, and your specialization is finance. You are expected to know what finance is all about. When you're doing business, someone asks, what business are you into? I am rearing chicken, okay? But do you know how to rear chicken? No, I have a manager. Okay. But what do you know? I know how to eat. Coco, I love. But you want to be successful. And you even come and tell the pastor, Pastor, I am so worried. For what? I want to be successful in my business. But what do you know? Nothing. 
The basic is what? Someone says, I, I'm interested in a forex trading. Okay. Do you know what forex means? Foreign exchange. This guy will never prosper. Many of you, you want to become rich overnight. Without having the basics. What is that? You want to set up a pharmacy. Who will be the manager? My sister. She will make you sick. And you will be the one to eat all the medicines from your own pharmacy. Why? Because you don't know. You don't have the... I have money. Okay. But what do you know? I know money. You know money? No money. Okay, but what do you know? Money. The Muyaya, some people, they speak the same thing again and again and again and again. Knowledge is the most basic. Knowing. The next comes understanding. What is it? Understanding is to know. How things work. You want to import things, but you don't know how to import. You call everyone, I am an importer. What are you importing? I'm still planning. But you said you are an importer. What are you importing? No, we have people. They will import that balls for you. What is the second? Understand. Then comes wisdom. That's the epitome where you reach the apex. Applying what you know. Applying how things work. What is that? Wisdom. The Bible says we have read the scriptures. The, even the first step, what is that? Knowledge. How does it come? How does it come? I will go back to unit one because of you. Have you heard? The moment you begin to hate evil, you have graduated with a certificate in what? About 25 years ago, or even more, I think, one of my management gurus spoke and he gave me this case. The Scandinavians are known for shipbuilding. So there was a time, a very rich guy, he got a cruise. You know cruise ships? Got a cruise. It went on a sail for about a month and came back and docked. So when it was on the docks, then they started again. The cruise didn't start. They switched on nothing. So this millionaire, the guy who owns the, the, the cruise, he, he said, now bring everyone from Scandinavia. I want even those guys who built this ship, this cruise, to come and repair my cruise. They all came. Some people even came in chartered aircrafts to repair what? The cruise ship came. They did whatever they could, but they couldn't do anything. They said, sorry, sir. Until one of his managers who came to him and told him, Sebo, why are you struggling and why are you wasting money like this, calling all these boys from different countries? But there is a man in that village down there. That man is a descendant of the biggest and the largest shipbuilder, but they got broke, and this guy is known for shipbuilding. And he said, does he have a company registered with URSB? No. Does he have a TIN number? They said, no. Then he asked, what does he have? 
He has a small shack with rusted tools. You mean that guy could come and touch my a, a billion dollar cruise? Oh, no. Then the guy pleaded, at least give him a chance. Let him come and see and go. So the guy comes in his rusted bicycle. He was riding his bicycle and he packed his bicycle. He took his box, a rusted box with some tools. And he was an old man and he just came near the ship and he put the tools down there. And he looked at the owner. The owner didn't want to even look at him. Old man, he opened his toolbox. He had hammers of different sizes and weight. Hammer. He took one hammer, put it out took another one, put it out. He took another one and he took another hammer. Uh, hit it like this. And he said, okay. He took the hammer. He went down to the hall and he looked at the rudder and the axle that was pumping, gearing up the fan underneath. And he took that small hammer and he just, uh, he hammered it one place. And he said, start now. The thing started. And the old man, he put back his tools. Took his bicycle. And he said, I'm coming. And the owner said, how much? The guy told him, so I'm going to send you an invoice. Okay, I hope it is not a frisk. No, oh, I will send you an invoice. I am not on the online system. But I'll send you a what? Invoice. Within half an hour, the man who brought him from the shipping corporation, he brought an invoice. And the, the owner looked at the invoice. How much? $50,000. What did this guy do? $50,000. No, 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 no. This is unbelievable. We can't accept this nonsense. The guy is old. The guy comes in a rusty bicycle. He takes, he takes a, a hammer and he hits somewhere. And the thing, it was just a fluke. It was just by luck the thing started. I am not going to pay. Okay. The old man came back, said, it's like you don't want to pay. Now, this is ridiculous. In my entire business career, do you know where I got my business graduation from? Harvard Business School. Harvard. What you're seeing is what? Harvard. And you're giving me an invoice for 50,000 shillings. I mean, $50,000, sorry. What have you done? I can do this myself. So the old man said, okay. He again opened his toolbox. Took another hammer. This time he didn't even go inside. He hit in one plate. Talk. Put the hammer inside. Put the box on his bicycle. Have you seen those bicycle tube, those strips eh, with which they tie? He used that to tie. He left. The owner looked at him. Hmm, this guy is ruthless. We will go. Let's start. That they started. They did start. Then the guy started panicking. Hey, what did he do? He just hammered the thing and it stopped again. Then he said, bring the hammers. <laughs> bring. Hey, bring all the hammers. So they brought a, a, a wheelbarrow full of what? Hammers. Then the owner said, okay. 
The first time he went inside like this, and he looked at one, two, three, hey, that. The thing didn't start. Said, hey, okay. Second time he hit somewhere and the thing stopped. Maybe I will hit it again. And he said, ah, start. Mm -mm. The production manager, the chief manager comes and he says, now, you have spoiled everything. Are you going to bring the other Scandinavian shipping corporations, big guys who come in chartered flight and you, you spent close to a million dollars just to repair this thing. That guy asked only for $50,000. What is wrong with you? He said, no, I am a Harvard business guy. I cannot waste money like this on an old man with an old rusted hammer who comes and hits the thing and goes off. Call him again. The old man came again. This time he didn't come with his toolbox. He had one hammer here, another hammer here. He comes and he takes one of the hammers and he takes another hammer in the, in the second hand and he hits the ship on one spot with both the hammers. Doing that, the thing started. Now the frustrated owner said, give me an invoice now. He said, this time I'm not going to my workshop. I'll give you the invoice right away. He took a piece of paper. $100,000. <laughs> now the guy became even more furious. He said, I'm not going to pay this fella even $1. How can, give me an itemized bill. I am a Harvard business guy. Give me an itemized bill. The guy said, okay. Cost of the hammer, one dollar. Cost of the first trip, two dollars. Cost of the second trip, two dollars. Next item, knowing where to hit. $99,000, 500. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Knowledge. To know it is only God who can teach you how. You might be doing business and you're failing business after business. Let me tell you now. Fear God and that is to hate evil. God will give you the wisdom. God will give you the knowledge. Depend on God. And God alone Submit and surrender everything into the hands of God and he will establish it. You may think that you are a strategist. Let me tell you, your strategies are nothing but foolishness. You may even have a postgraduate diploma in strategic management. You may even have four point whatever GPA. It is useless. None of your strategies work, will work. Unless you surrender everything. It is God alone who can establish strategy. Daniel and his friends, they depended on God. The Bible says, God gave them wisdom. God gave them knowledge. I'm also interested to bring only one character before we sing the last song. Turn with me to the book of Exodus. Book of Exodus, chapter 31. Book of Exodus, chapter 31. Verse 1. The Bible says this. And the Lord spake unto Moses. Who is speaking? Saying, See, I have called by name Bezaliel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Listen to what the next verse says. And I, God, and I, the Lord, and I, Jehovah, 
have filled him with the what? The spirit of God. In what? In wisdom. And in what? In understanding. And in what? In knowledge. It is a rare quality for God to bless you with all the three. It's the rarest of the rarest. For God to give you knowledge, for God to bless you with understanding, and for God to bless you with wisdom. You can never be wise if you are not knowledgeable. You can never be wise if you don't have understanding and slow in understanding. Even the art of speaking is a talent. It may not be a skill. What is important in today's church is skill. When I talk about skill, it is the knowledge. Knowing how to. Everyone cannot be a surgeon. Even a butcher and a surgeon does the same thing, but in a different way. So a butcher can never be a surgeon, and a surgeon can never be a butcher. Probably sometimes, depending on the alcohol level of the surgeon. What a blessing it is. To have knowledge from God. To be blessed with understanding from God. And to be blessed with wisdom from God. And the most fundamental fact here is the skill. That is the knowledge. Knowing how to. Like the old man who knew where to hit the ship. That is a unique wisdom God will bless you with. As Adventists, you should not be suffering. Many times we want to take shortcuts to get rich. Let me tell you, you will never achieve what you want. Never. Oppression. You will never. You will never. Lies. You will never. Submit and surrender everything to the will of God and begin to hate evil. Hating, to begin to hate evil is also to surrender and ask for forgiveness from God. You can never hate evil without asking for forgiveness from God. The first step here is to forgive. Ask for forgiveness. Our God is faithful and just. He will forgive all our trespasses against us. And when we trust in Him, and when we trust in His promises, He is fair and just to forgive. And he has also promised that I will remove your sins as far as east is to the west. And he has also promised I will remember your sins no more. All that we need to do is to, oh Lord, and speak to him and say, rock of ages, cliff for me. Let me hide myself. Let thy water and thy blood from thy riven side which flowed. Let it alone give me cure. Begin. With forgiveness. When you ask for forgiveness. And when you tell God, Lord, I am empty. Fill my cup until it runneth over. Because God is a God who knows how to fill your cup until it runneth over. All that you need to do is to come to God and tell him, Lord, I am completely empty. Empty as I am. Fill my cup until it runneth over. Surely. The Bible says, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow you. Also. Anywhere and everywhere you go, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow you. All through your life. They will be like your shadow. They will follow you everywhere you go. Anywhere you go. And everywhere and anywhere you go, go with Jesus Christ. God will establish your plans. God will ask, ask and God says, ask and I will give it unto you. If any of you lacketh wisdom, ask the Lord and he says, I will give you liberally. Sometimes you may be reading something and you read about 100 pages and at the end of the 100th page you wonder what you read. Ask the Lord. Put your knees on the floor. Ask God. He will fill your cup until it runneth over. Basic fact here is fear God. Fear God is to hate evil. When you begin to hate evil, 
technology is a byproduct. Hello? Then the moment you begin to hate evil, knowledge is only a what? A byproduct. You cannot resist knowledge. You don't have to necessarily go to school to acquire knowledge. God, if he decides to flood you with knowledge, one command is enough. You will be the wisest of the wise. If you're struggling in your business and if you're thinking that I'm trying and my struggling is too much and I've even forgotten my own name in the struggle. And Lord, when am I going to get back? Hate evil. Hate evil. You will see your business flourishing. You will see that you are sleeping like a baby. Do you know that scripture says, it is God who commandeth sleep for his beloved? Have you heard that? If you're losing sleep, I don't know how many of you lose sleep in the night. Tell God today, I'm your son, I'm your daughter. Come and lift me up. Let me have a sound night rest like a baby. God will give you sleep. God will give you rest from your enemies. God will give you rest from every problem that you're facing in your business. God will give you remedy from everything that you're facing in your workplaces. God will make you flourish because God has commanded, be fruitful. We have dominion over everything. That is a command. When you are a good steward and go to him and tell God, God, I have surrendered everything to you. I have nothing to my credit, but I surrender everything unto you. God will fill your cup. But go to God with your empty cup. Don't tell him that you are half empty. Don't tell him that you are half full. Go empty yourself and tell him, Lord, I am empty. Fill my cup until he fill it and it run it over. The Lord bless you. It is my prayer that God gives you the privilege to be knowledgeable, to have the understanding the world cannot give you, and to be the wisest. God. To be the glory.
to make this appeal. If there is anyone who feels that that you have not done good in your life, probably every time you take an initiative, it also always takes you two steps behind. You have failed in many things. Job, relationship, businesses. You feel that you need to come to the Lord and pray with me. Walk to the front. You can even come and stand here. As we sing the last stanza. May the Lord unblock everything that is blocking your way. May God unlock everything that the devil has locked for you. May redemption come nigh. If there is something that you are crying about, come, come forward, please. Come this side. Join me as we pray together. You want to be successful in life. Definitely it is not God's will that you should suffer in life. It is definitely not God's will. God is waiting for a chance to come and fill your life with his wisdom. The Bible says in the book of Genesis... He just made a command. He said, let there be light. And there was light. God's words are powerful, friends of God. God's words are just commands, children of God. Trust in His word. Trust in His promises. Hold on to His promises. Because His promises are A and Amen. And it will be fulfilled when you cry and pour out your heart unto him. And cry and tell him, Lord, enough is enough. I am tired. Come and redeem me. Peter, when he saw Jesus Christ walking on water, he had the desire in his heart that he also must walk on water like any one of us would do. All of us, we at one point of time want to walk on water. But as he began to walk on water, in fact, the Bible says he actually walked on water. He is a second human being who ever walked on water next to Jesus Christ when he was a human on this earth. The moment he came near, the Bible says he began to sink and he said, Master, save me. One prayer. You don't have to pray the entire Bible and quote even scriptures. Imagine if this guy started quoting scriptures, would have gone down to the deep depth. He just said, Master, save me, period. He just, the master who created the heaven and the earth, master who even divided the firmament from the waters above and the waters beneath, and he took him by his hand, he just took him out of the water. Many of you, you're going through the experience of Peter beginning to sink. Somebody is sinking. Thank God that you are not sunk. Amen. Thank God that you made it today. Thank God that he brought you to his presence today. That is a testimony and a fact that you have not sunk yet. All that is required to do is just to say that prayer. Lord, save me. And just don't put your fingers, I mean, hands down. Peter said, hold me, save me. You have to take that in a shed. That is a time that we have, right? Child of God, I don't know what is really creeping into your heart. I don't know what is troubling you. God knows and you know. Never tell it out to human beings because we are unkind. Tell it to Jesus. Because he knows how to know and understand how to relieve you from that trouble. 
ball on your knees. Don't ever confess this to human beings. They are, they are unkind, ruthless. Put your knees down to the floor and tell him, Lord, save me. He will come to your rescue. He will surely, I said surely, hey, I said surely he will come to rescue you. God is a God who is faithful. All that is required is to put your knees on the floor and cry unto him. God is good. He is just. He is faithful to give you knowledge. Understanding of everything. Joseph was an ordinary guy. He was a slave in the land of Egypt. But God had the power and the thought to make him second to Pharaoh in the land where he was taken as a slave. God is able to change your course of life. Today I can tell you in the presence of God. Just trust in Him. Trust in His words. Trust in His promises. Trust in His ability. Trust in His authority. Trust in His word. And all that you need to do is now is to surrender and tell Him, Lord, I am just empty. I am empty. He is so good. He is compassionate. He is kind to fill you until your cup runneth over. Somebody say amen to that. Child of God. There is no problem that is beyond God's power. Believe it. There is nothing. I said there is nothing that is impossible for you. All that is required is the justice of Tell him, Lord, my cup is empty. My cup is empty. I'm tired of this empty cup. Let me tell you, you will testify in the presence of the congregation. God bless you. Do you speak to your God? Tell him why you're here. Tell him that one problem that is eating your countenance up. Tell him how that problem is leaving yourself sleepless in the night. Tell him how that problem is making you abnormal. Tell him how that is really spoiling your psyche and you're ever angered. Tell your God. Tell it to Jesus. Because burden. Lifted up Calvary. He is a friend so true. He is compassionate. He is loving. Our God the Father, who did not even spare his only begotten son for your sake. For your sake. For your sake. Oh, it is for your sake. He had you in his mind. Wouldn't he do what you're asking for now? Would it be too difficult for him to understand the problem that you are into right now? Child of God. No. God is able. God is able. God is able. Speak to him. Speak to him. My God, my friend, your children have come with the hope that you will not let them go back to their seats without giving them an assurance that their prayer has been answered. You are a God who answers prayer. Your hand will never refrain from touching your children. Pass them not, O gentle Savior. Hear the humble cry. Hear the silent cry. Hear that cry that is from the bottom of their heart. 
Many of your children who are standing here, they are drenching their pillows wet during the night because of overcrying. The Bible says that you have accountability of every teardrop that has fallen from the eyes of your children. May those tears speak right now and be compassionate, O oh Father. Some of your children who are standing here, they have spent more time on their knees than on their feet, crying like Hannah did. It is my prayer, dear Lord, attend to those children. Attend to your daughters who are standing here. Attend to your sons who are standing here. Whatever the problem is, I pray and I plead. Lord, I beg, attend to their prayer. Because you're a God who answers prayer. Some of us, we have even given up some of these problems that we have faced. But you are a God who will never forget the problems that we had buried. You came to the tomb of Lazarus and you said, Lazarus, come forth. A man who was buried four days ago. Oh Lord God in heaven, you have power in your command. You could even raise Dead Lazarus alive and he walked out of his tomb. What is hard for you, O oh Lord? There is nothing hard. There is nothing impossible to you, O oh Father. I'm shouting because it is a cry. It is a cry. It is a cry. O oh Lord, it is a cry. Lord, it is a cry. It comes from the bottom of our heart. O oh loving Father, your children are standing here. They have come expecting a miracle. You are a God of restoration. You made all the miracles. Most of the miracles were performed on a Sabbath day. With that hope and faith, I come to you. Work out a miracle right now for your children, O oh Father. Pass them not, O oh gentle Savior. There are showers of blessing around. Mercy drops round us are falling. But Lord, we plead for showers. We are grateful for the mercy drops round us fall. We are ever grateful. We are thankful. We give you glory. We give you honor. Blessed be your name because of the showers that you are about to give us. Thank you for the mercy drops. But for showers we plead. Oh Lord, we stand in your presence to plead for showers of blessings. If these blessings are not for your children, what are those blessings for? Are you going to give it to the pagans? Oh Lord, are you going to give it to the unbelievers? When your children are crying from the bottom of their heart in your holy presence as we approach your throne of majesty. Unlock everything that is locked. Break all the hurdles that are put across your children. But forgive their trespasses. We are also made of dust. We are limited by time. We are limited by understanding. And we are always inclined to, to, to sin against thee. But forgive us. Forgive us. Lord, forgive us. The sins we had committed, we want to pour and throw it at your feet right now. Burdens are lifted up on Calvary. When the burdens are lifted up on Calvary, we can walk majestically to our house and say, and talk to our friends and say, the Lord has been so good and he has relieved from all the pain and anguish. May it be a testimony for your children. All those who are standing in your presence, these are testimonies. All these are potential testimonies. All these are potential testimonies. Oh, the heavens may it look at these young people also. Those who are tired of being single, attend to them. Because it is you who declare that man shall not live alone. Father. Father. My friend. Speak to your children. Comfort them. For some of them had lost comfort. Some of them had lost hope. Give them hope, Lord. Give them one more chance. You are a God of second chances. You are a God who gives a second chance for your children. Oh Lord, even a third chance for your children. Oh Lord, even the fourth chance. You are a God of chances, not limited by numbers. 
As long as we come in your presence and lift up our voice in thanksgiving and supplications raised up into your holy majestical throne, Father, may you be gracious. We need knowledge. You have promised. And we read it. If any of you lack the wisdom, let him ask of me and I shall give it to him. You promised. We want to claim that promise in your presence in this prayer. We want to cling on to that promise. Unless you bless us, we are not going to get out of this place. Unless you bless us, oh Lord, we are not going to refrain from crying out to you. Bless us, oh Lord. Bless your children. Bless your children now. Do not pass them not. Father, I pray. Thank you so much. You're an answer. For those who are, have troubled heart, may peace prevail. May peace prevail. Lord, you are a prince of peace. All oh, the peace that passes with all understanding comes only from your throne of majesty. May peace reign over the home where there is no peace. Where there are misunderstanding, fighting and whatever loving father. May you go there today. May you visit that home today. You decide to visit Zacchaeus' home and you pronounce salvation has come to this home. Pronounce that for your children today. Some of the parents are so sick with their children. They are stubborn. Some of them have been giving up upon their children because of drug addiction, alcoholism, you name it, all the sins combined. But these are your children. Call them by name. Call them by name. Call them by name now. Father, call them by name. Because you call them, you call us always by our names. Call them by name. Pronounce their name now. Let the children who had left home, who are lost, may they come back. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. The breath of life that you're holding in our nostrils. Thank you, living Father. Thank you, Lord, for crowning our life with good health and strength. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for clothing us better than many millions of people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you. Thank you so much. You have given us a means of transport. Thank you. You have given us a roof above our head. Thank you. You have given us a church to worship you in truth and in spirit. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you for the religious liberty we are enjoying in this country. Thank you. Thank you for our elders. Thank you for our pastors. Thank you for the church. Thank you for our children. Thank you for the youth. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, oh Lord. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. We bring on uh, glory belong to you. Honor belongeth to you. Forgive us. Thank you so much for hearing my prayer. If there is any supplication that I had not raised, may the Holy Spirit bring it up in your presence and may it appear as a sweet savor. And may you accept it. Grant to us. Because we have prayed this prayer from the bottom of our heart and we have prayed this prayer in the mighty and the sweetest name that we had ever known and that is your son, Jesus Christ. And we say, Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus. Let's keep singing that song as we go back. <laughs>